The Drysdale Lecture is named after Scottish evangelist John Douglas Drysdale and features various aspects of contemporary mythology. Some of the previous speakers include Chris Wright, the late Andrew Walls, Kirsten Kim, and Sut Murray Williams. And this year, we are welcoming Lon Ling Lee as the speaker of the Drysdale Lecture 2022. Lon currently serves as the editor of Lojan Global Analysis. Her previous roles include lecture in mission at Redcliffe College, UK, training director of Asia CMS based in Malaysia, mission mobilization with OMF, and pastor at Grace Singapore Chinese Church. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Long Ling Li as she addresses the topic Future of Mission, Strategic Role of Asia Mission in Global Christianity. Let's welcome her. Thank you very much. Really glad to be here, despite the weather. <laughs> and that um, it's really a privilege and opportunity to be sharing this time with you, especially in view of the launch of this new center. And um, another great bonus of this whole arrangement is to uh, get to know Mija and her husband, Pastor Yun Ho. And uh, we have a lovely meal just done together. And it's just like good old friends, but actually we've not known each other. So we just come born together by the um, love of Christ and the gospel of Jesus Christ. So um, without further ado, I'd like to start with this lecture. For this evening, we will spend some time starting and starting to understand the context, which is global Christianity, and then more specifically, Asian Christianity, and then moving from Christianity into mission trends, global mission trends, and particularly the trends and missions and issues in Asian mission. We want to look at some models of matured Asian mission, some historical development that started many years ago, and also some emerging Asian mission with stories and people and what they've done for the Lord. And including in this emerging Asian mission, I would like to share something of the Asian diaspora mission, particularly those in the UK. And lastly, I have to talk about future of missions since it's in the topic. So some practical recommendations, how we can move forward towards the future of mission today. First of all, what are the current trends in global Christianity? One question we can ask is, is Christianity shrinking or shifting? I would like to base my analysis or understanding of this trend from the resources from this book, World Christian Encyclopedia, the latest edition by Johnson and Sulo. And lots of good data, um, also from the World Christian database. Looking at this chart, this graph, it tells us global percentage of Christians for the past 100 years. And you will see that for the entire past 100 years, Christians have made up approximately one third of the world's population. So in 1900, about 35%. And in 2050, the world will likely have about 35% Christians. This is known as the one-third barrier of global Christianity because it's around one-third of the world populations are Christians. Why is that so? Why is it that we could not break that barrier or break down that barrier? And how can we do that if we wish to? At the first glance of this chart, 
There seems to be little change in the status of global Christianity over the past 100 years. But this actually masks the dramatic changes that have taken place in the geography of global Christianity. For the picture of a world Christian demography, we see that there's the steady decline of Christianity in the global north. About 33% of Christians are in the global north, and that has been surpassed by the rise of Christianity in the global south, which is 67%. There's a projection that by the year 2050, probably 2.6 billion or 77% of all Christians are in the global south. So this shift of the center of gravity of the church from the north into the south is not merely demographic. It is also reflected in the vitality and growing influence of non-Western Christianity. And also in this Christian demography, we are interested to also note that in Europe and Oceania, much of these places have become mission fields these used to be mission-sending countries. And we want, we, in this mission fields, not only that we are reaching diaspora, but also local people. There's a recent article in Christianity Today that asserts that the largest mission field in Europe is not any other group, but those who call themselves Christians, but show few, if any, signs of faith. What about Christianity in Asia? What is the picture there? Christian grew twice as fast as the general population over the 20th century. So that is great news. However, we need to note that Asia is still the least evangelized region with only 8.2% Christians in 2020, with about 60% of global population living in Asia. So there's still a great need there, because sometimes when we present this picture, some people say, oh, then there's no need to evangelize Asia, and we don't need to send any more missionaries to Asia, right? No, because of this picture. And also, Asia has a seedbed of the world's major religions like Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, and they are still growing. So the Hindu population grew over the same period, though they are still concentrated in the Indian continent, subcontinent. Muslim grew at a somewhat faster pace and displaced Chinese folk religionists as the continent's largest religion, with 7.4% of the population in 2020. Despite the growth of, this, of these religions, it strikes me quite interestingly that Asia has become the most non-religious continent in the 20th century as well. By about 2020, more than 600 million, which is about um, uh, mainly those are agnostics and atheists, which grew the fastest. So we see that there's this picture in the Christianity in Asia, lots of growth and yet still lots of needs. Moving from Christianity to mission trends, what is the global mission trends? Missionaries from everywhere and receive everywhere. That is the trend that we have heard of many times, I'm sure. But yet, in a closer look at the details, there are some quite interesting or maybe surprising uh, statistics as well. So countries with largely Christian populations receive relatively more missionaries than majority non-Christian countries. One dramatic example of this is Brazil, a largely Christian country, and yet it's received a total of about 20,000 missionaries. Whereas Bangladesh, with nearly as many people as Brazil, receives only 1,000 missionaries. Why is that so? You ask me. I don't know. 
And then also, at the same time, many countries with very low Christian populations, such as Palestine, Japan, Algeria, Mongolia, still send missionaries from their countries. Thank God for that. But sadly, for others with large Christian population, such as many in Eastern Europe, send virtually none. So this is a happy and yet a sad scenario that we need to reflect upon. Just have a closer look at missionaries sent and received the year 2020, particularly um, focusing on Asia and Europe. I'll just zoom in to the next slide and you can see that, for example, in Asia, with a Christian population of about eight, just 8.2 percent, they have sent out 91,000 missionaries, which is 240 missionaries per million Christians. So compared to Europe, with a Christian population of 76.1 percent, well, at least by in name Christian, they sent out 80,900 missionaries, which is only 140 missionaries per million Christians. So it's interesting, again, some statistics for us to reflect, reflect upon, not to be proud of, just to be boasting about these statistics, but to really reflect what God is doing in our world today. I would like to share with you a little bit more, a uh, uh, few more specific stories of, co uh, of Asian mission movements, particularly starting with the matured Asian movements, and then to the emerging ones. So first to start with, and that is the Korean Mission Movement. It has 100 years of history. It started in 1907. Okay? And between the years 1988 and 2013, the Korean church emerged as a leading missionary sending force, many serving in Asia and in countries with a Muslim majority. Yet the rate of growth decreased in recent years, sadly. And we need to address many issues and concerns of the Korean mission. Recently, I had a good chat with a Korean missiologist, Dr. Steve Moon, and he shared with me some of the information or data and shared with me some of the issues and concerns that the Korean mission face, faces. So, so these are four key issues and concerns they need to address. He said, first of all, one, how can we care for missionaries well, including the issue of missionary kids' education? And because of the lack of good member care or missionary care, there's a high attrition rate. Many leave the mission field earlier than expected. Secondly, how can we facilitate leadership development for Korean mission? We need more equipped leaders, especially amongst the younger generation. Thirdly, how can we participate? Sorry. How can we participate in and facilitate partnerships in missions? We need to work together across borders, across boundaries of culture, of traditions, and organizations. Many Korean missiologists feel that um, Korean, because of its culture, which is very monocultural, cultural, many Korean mission organizations are also very monocultural, just work amongst each uh, ourselves, work amongst Koreans mainly. So that is a key concern. And fourthly, how can Korean missions best undertake self-missiologizing. This term he uses to mean doing missiology with both the local and the global, and the global interdependently, not just independently. And uh, we also realize that when we talk about Asian theology, Asian theology has to be missiological in the way that it has to grow out of the mission context in Asia to have an impact in the church to be relevant. So when we talk about self-theologizing, Asian theologizing, we need to take into context the mission context of Asia. 
And this Asian mission and theological context, if I may summarize in just these few points, just very generally, is that the mission church, Asian church, is in the midst of a multi-faith multi communities and is in the context of poverty and injustices and in the context of suffering of persecuted church. So for example, according to Open Doors, the World Watch List 2022, North Korea was named as the second worst country after Afghanistan in terms of persecution. So how should the church respond, both in Asia and the West, to such a scenario in Asia? And the context is also in Asia is a very globalized, materialistic, increasingly secular context. At a meeting with an Asian mission leader recently, he asked me, can the church and mission in the West help us, especially in this area? Because you have faced secularization of the church before us. So maybe there's some things, that, some things there that you have learned, lessons that you've learned that you could help us. That is a good question that we can ask our churches around us. Besides the Korean mission movement, there are other mature mission in Asia as well. Indian mission, the Philippines mission, is also a very mature mission. They've started missions also around 100 years ago. It's not that they're that young mission. And also the Chinese churches in East Asia, the growth of the Chinese churches in Taiwan, Hong Kong, Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia. And from being mission-receiving countries, uh, these Asian nations have become mission-sending countries. Indigenous mission agencies have sprouted from multiple centers in Asia. I don't have time to sh share a lot of uh, the history and the stories, but if I may, I would like to share just very briefly my own church in Singapore. Um, 50 years ago, we started our mission program, sending out cross-cultural missionaries both locally and across the seas. And also um, the budget of the finance budget in the church, more than 50% was given to mission, which is very rare in most churches. But God bless our church. As we give more to missions, God give us more people for the church. Does church growth from one congregation to three congregations as we obey God in this mission mandate? And recently, uh, my, our, my senior pastor uh, writes in the uh, mission handbook, and he says, the church does not exist for herself. She exists for others. As I'm writing, a group of brothers and sisters of our church have packed hundreds of bags, each containing surgical masks, soap, hand san hand sanitizer, and uh, vitamins to be distributed to the migrant workers from South Asia and Singapore. It is our prayer that as they open their hands to receive our gifts, May the Lord open their hearts to accept his gift of salvation. Yeah. We have many lessons we need, still need to learn to grow, but God has blessed the church as a result of mission, uh, uh, mission involvement. This is the most exciting and interesting part, maybe, because I'm telling you more stories of people, actual people, and about exciting growth that's coming out of Asian mission in China, in Cambodia, in Bhutan, and in Asian diaspora mission. So for example, in China, some significant breakthroughs in the development of the indigenous mission movement from China. As China has become increasingly global in its interactions, the opportunities for churches and individual Christians have also increased. At the same time, mission awareness and teaching in churches has also increased to the point where there is an increasing emphasis on reaching across borders and cultures. A few years ago, um, I had the opportunity to meet with some indigenous Chinese mission leaders. They just um, organized and conducted a mission conference uh, which they are very proud of, that this time we organize a mission conference. We don't have to just attend those that's organized by the West. And they said that um, when we sat down with them and we asked them, um, 
What needs do you have? What do you think the church outside of China can contribute to the growth of your mission in China or from China? And they paused, they reflected, and they said, we don't need your money. We don't need you to help us to mobilize more people to go as missionaries because we have a long queue, people waiting to be sent out. But we need two things, if you can help us, especially churches that have been involved in mission in the West that have lots of experience in these two areas, they believe. One is cross-cultural training, equipping our workers. We find that many of our churches send out workers before they are well-equipped for mission, and they experience lots of difficulties and even failures. Two, we need your help. Teach us how to do member care. We just don't know how to do that well. So very honest response, and we need to listen. When we want to help, we want to first ask this question, how can we help you? What are your needs before we come and help them? Anyway, I move on to the next one. Next emerging mission is the Cambodian emerging missions. I'd like to show you this. A couple of years back, when Kang Sen and I were with uh, CMS in Asia, we were invited to um, train indigenous mission leaders in Cambodia because they want to multiply indigenous missional leadership. And the leadership training um, are mainly for pastors and leaders on mission of the church, missional leadership in Buddhist context, which is the Cambodian uh, mission context. Majority are Buddhists. And they do this in collaboration with each other and particularly with this Shalom Mission Cambodia, which is an indigenous mission organization founded and started by a Cambodian, a young man with a great vision. His passion for mission started when he helped in the, work in the office of World Vision in Cambodia. And he felt God calling him to start this mission organization. And you can see that it's, it's just excellent. Three departments consisting of church planting, leadership training, community development. And he oversees 32, this organization oversees 32 churches planted by Shalom Mission Cambodia in nine provinces without, throughout Cambodia. And he has this high goal or vision to plant a church in every province in Cambodia and develop true disciples of Jesus Christ who will transform their communities holistically. Wow, where did he get all these ideas? And I was just so impressed with this young man with this great vision with this, but with humility, he's asking for more help. Also in Bhutan, we were also very, very um, surprised to find this group of Bhutanese church and mission leaders who were so passionate about growth, about training, about being more equipped for mission. There's this postgraduate mission program that was started by this group that we met that was accredited by the Asia Pacific Theological Seminary in the Philippines. And they're very serious about their training, not just academically, but practically. So we sat down with the Bhutanese leaders and said, before we come and help you in the training, can we ask you these questions? What are the challenges that are being encountered by the growing church in Bhutan? They thought for a while and said, these are the challenges we face each day. The hierarchical culture amongst the leadership, including the church leadership. And how can we bridge the gap or close the gap between the older and younger generations? Also, they said, how can, can, can this question they ask, can Bhutanese churches be missional focused when most of the people within the nation predominantly Buddhists, are still unreached. Must we reach our own people first before we think of going out? So these are very valid questions. How can we help them? They ask. And lastly, the emerging mission movement also is among the Asian emerging mission movements. 
the Asian diaspora mission has been impacted very much by a group of women from the Philippines. They may not be highly qualified professionals, and their names may not appear in any mission biographies, but their mission initiatives and impact will be recorded in history. They are the thousands of evangelical Christian women from the Philippines working as housekeepers, nannies, caregivers in royal courts and the average home around the world. A high percentage are in the Middle East and in North Africa where missionary visas are not given. And together with their male counterparts, they belong to a movement called the Filipino International Network, which seizes opportunities to be trained to reach the nations through themselves being widely dispersed globally. And they have become a powerhouse for the cause of world mission. Now let's move to slightly closer home that is Diaspora in the UK, and the story of Sam from Nepal. We met Sam when we were teaching in Redcliffe College, and he was one of our students. After he completed his MA studies, he moved um, back to Nepal and started an advanced mission training program in Nepal. Really made into good use. We're so glad, we hope we have more such students who will use their training back in their home. And he was a very significant mission leader in Nepal. But this, just a few years back, maybe just a couple of years back, he felt the call, the call for God to work among the Asian diaspora in the UK. Before I tell you a little bit more about him, just a little bit more about diaspora mission in the UK. We know that the Chinese church has been involved in Asian diaspora in the UK for many, many years or decades. COCM, the um, Chinese Overseas Christian Mission, has planted many churches in the UK. But as you know, some of you may know, they have expanded or ex grew from just reaching diaspora Chinese in the UK to reaching Chinese all over Europe and the goal is reaching many Chinese to reach Europe, not just to reach the Chinese. So beyond really the diaspora ministry. And we know too that recently there's influx of many um, migrants from Hong Kong coming into the UK. So we call that the second wave of Hong Kong migrants coming to the UK. Again, this is a major um, change, if I may say, a major challenge, new challenge to the Asian diaspora mission in the UK that we hope to take note more seriously and be more prepared for it. So back to this Sam. He works uh, mainly in, in uh, certain areas, but one area that, uh, that he worked mainly is Rochdale because of its diversity. As you may know, Rochdale is a multicultural town and possesses people from many nations all over the world. Example from Iran, Pakistan, India, Bhutan, Romania, Iraq, many African countries and many more. And Rochdale also has the highest level of asylum seekers anywhere in the UK. And because of his involvement in Rochdale, he was also asked or invited to work um, in a church, in the migrant or uh, immigrant church in Sheffield, which has a mixture of nationalities. I don't know how these three British guys feel in the midst of the many colours, other colours in their midst, and many cultures in their midst. But I think the Western church must consider seriously how they can relate to the new immigrant churches in such a manner that the influx of Christians from the global south may make a positive contribution towards reinvigorating, reinterpreting Christianity in the West. Are we humble enough to accept that? So, we have all that knowledge of Christian 
global Christianity, global mission trends, and the growth of Asian mission, what is the future of mission should be? Particularly within our focus this evening, this lecture, we are thinking of Asian mission in global Christianity. I believe that it is global partnership and collaboration. I'd just like to focus on these two areas, intercultural partnership and intergenerational partnership. Intercultural partnership. We need to empower indigenous theology and mission. And here, within our focus, particularly Asian theology and mission, if we want to work interculturally with Asian. So it's an intercultural partnership between Asian and the West. And I think um, there are many types of intercultural partnership, but because just the fo uh, focus of our lecture, we just mentioned these. But what does indigenous mean? It's a commitment to the local people and their context and to their missional agenda. We don't have our own agenda and impose on them. We need to listen to them. We need to hear their voices more and ask them to help us to understand them better. And we need to hand over lots of things to them, including leadership. Because in order to enable them to be effective, to be sustainable, they need to really grow to be self-sustaining, self-replicating, self-theologizing, self-mythologizing. And sometimes we find that as we do that, we realize actually they are quite capable. They probably could do a better job than we outsiders. Recently, because of the pandemic, the short and long-term implications accelerate a realization of the importance of local indigenous agency in mission with less dependency upon foreign missionary because many foreign missionaries couldn't return back to the mission field. And so the local indigenous people have to step up and take over many of the work that's left behind. And intercultural partnership, we also want to focus on relational partnership. The emphasis is on relationship. That is mutuality and reciprocity. There's a partnership of giving and receiving. One group of Asian mission leaders once sat down at the conference and they were asked this question. Can you have a reflection, have a self-reflection and let us know what are the, some weaknesses of this Asian indigenous, indigenous mission uh, that you face? that you need to address. Earlier, I mentioned the Korean mission movement. But again, this is, this is across Asia, not just Korean. And a very similar very, uh, 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 issues ca uh, uh, came up as a result of this reflection. And they, they were in this global mission conference. And they, shared, they said, some of these our weaknesses are, we have um, our financial support not frequently long term. We have a harvest mentality. We have uh, we, our missionaries lack training and leadership development, and we lack member care and personal development. So we are not able to keep our missionaries long, and uh, for, we have few candidates um, willing to go into so-called the less visible kind of ministry like Bible translations, and we have a tendency to send missionaries where the same language is spoken. Can you help us? Can the global church help us? So again, we want to say that we need to reflect on today's intercultural partnership in mission. What resources and expertise could the Western mission share with Asian indigenous mission that could help them in their areas of weakness? Also, what strengths can the West learn from Asian missions? For example, maybe in inter-religious uh, dialogues, as the church in Asia is in the midst of multi-faith communities, how far are we experiencing the practices of partnership, of giving, receiving, working, praying, rejoicing, struggling, suffering? 
and how far is this practice distorted by uneven distribution of power and money. And in the case of reverse mission that we often talk about, will Western churches and agencies receive into their midst Asian leaders and mission workers? Are we willing to receive help from people that we serve? That is the whole idea of mutuality and reciprocity. And quick, very quickly, in terms of intergenerational partnership, we realize that there's this whole new generation of Asian younger leaders rising to the challenges of missions. In fact, you realize some of the pictures, like for example, the mission leader in Cambodia is a young man. Many young professionals and university students are responding to the call to serve in strategic areas of missional engagement. The two crucial issues we need to address in intergenerational partnership is, are engaging and emerging generations of Asian mission leaders. They are the future of missions. We can't talk about the future of mission without including the younger generation. Secondly, embracing effective intergenerational partnerships for mission. Engage and embrace. Just very briefly, this group of South Asian Christian Youth Network, just as a model for our, our example, we had the opportunity to be in Nepal in 2016, be part of this conference that they held. And this network is very very unusual or special, is the network of youth movements. And their vision is to see young people trained to take up the task of leadership for mission in South Asian context in relation to globalized and marginalized communities. And we need to reflect, how can the global church adequately develop mature Christ-like next generation Asian leaders for its mission in a complex world today? Someone says, faithful stewardship of intergenerational leadership transitions as an intentional partnership for the gospel and global mission will raise up new leaders at various levels across the global church. Do you agree with this? It needs to be intentional. We have to give up some of our positions to let the younger people come on, may, come on board, maybe, as an example. Just for closing, I can't not talk about this center that you hope you, you're launching. And I'm just very, very encouraged to see the goals that you have in this center, especially the final one that says you want to invest and engage in research which emphasizes Asian Christianity, Asian readings of scripture, and Asian expressions of the gospel in theology and practice, and in doing so, to serve the wider church. And I really hope that what we have talked about today will help us to think a bit further how we can make this center a success, not just for the Asian community here, but for the wider church. May God help us. And before we go, I want to just conclude with this um, quote from Professor Alan Yeh, who is a professor of intercultural studies and missiology. And he says, the future of mission is polycentric from mission centers, and that the entire global church, whether denominational or geographical or age or gender or ethnicity, needs to work together to bring the gospel to the nations. May God help us to have unity in diversity so that the one-third barrier of global Christianity could be broken down. Thank you. Thank you, Alan, indeed, um, for this stimulating lecture, actually raising both inspiring and challenging questions for all of us. So I think we have about 15 minutes for question and answers. I'm going to invite questions from the floor and also 
um, the online participant. If you have any questions, feel free to um, write your questions on chat that we're going to read out loud here so that Lon can answer your questions. <coughs> any questions from here? I can go home now. <laughs> yes, yes, please. Would you like to come up here and write them? Uh, the word partnership arose several times and I sense that I can understand that and in fact some of the students who are writing on that area find that a real challenge and wonder why it's not happening. I just wonder if there's any parallel to be drawn with the Hong Kong immigrants as a second wave and you talked about the challenges facing Asian mission in the UK. Now just as a parallel for a moment would any of those challenges reflect a partnership and if so, I imagine in this partnership there are particular challenges. Now, I, could, could you respond to that first of all and then I just maybe have a follow on. Uh, so it, what, part, what challenges do you expect uh, brought because of the Hong Kong immigration for the Asian church presently in the UK? Okay. So challenges for the Asian church, is that yes, what you're, yeah. okay, yeah, the focus. Well, it's still ongoing, so I don't think they have a very objective analysis at, the, at, at this time. But as I have heard from Asian church leaders who have been trying to involve in this area, I think one is that um, this group of uh, Hong Kong newcomers are quite different from the previous wave generation where they are mainly maybe um, not so highly educated as this coming group. This uh, new group, they are more professionals, more middle income Hong Kong people. And so the culture may be different. The way to deal with them may be different from the first wave. Uh, of Hong Kong Christians, Hong Kong coming, Hong Kongers coming here. So that is the challenge uh, to understand first of all this new wave. Okay. Secondly, I think that um, th we need more unity again, partnership in terms of welcoming this uh, group of people. And there are some networks that have started called Welcome Churches. I don't know whether you know Welcome Churches that in the, in the website. And there are people who are trying to coordinate this whole uh, welcoming gesture, showing hospitality, and instead of um, making one group, I mean one area, lots of people doing the work, other areas, nobody's doing work. So some networks have started as a result. So, but it's challenging because it's new, so they need to work together, yeah. And I'm, I'm hearing, uh, as I work particularly with some students who want to write in this area, that they feel they come prepared, but when they arrive, they're told by the people of the country that they need further training and feel quite upset about that. Now, I'm wondering if um, a partnership goes really the direction of understanding intercultural, you talked about that, and understanding the culture. Um, Bridging that gap of each being the learner and each being the giver is an enormous challenge, I feel. Do you have any thoughts about how that can be done? Well, I think you have said it very, very wisely. I think I fully agree with you. Both sides need to learn. And I think before they come, maybe they, they need to be prepared, first of all, to understand the situation here so that they will not be unnecessarily disappointed. You know, so I think both sides, the, the send, the, those who are helping them to go and those who are receiving here, both need to learn how to handle this group of new wave of Hong Kong people. So I think we are still studying, doing research on it. We can't have all the answers now, but thank you for asking the question. Thank you. We have a question from the online participant. So Ezekiel asks, um, he wonders what your comment might be regarding the relatively low missionary uptake in Europe in comparison to Asia, and what lessons can Europe learn? <laughs> well, I think it's the whole um, result of the decline of Christianity in Europe. Um, we, we do not want to rejoice over it, but yet we need to face reality. And because as churches decline, they have less resources 
to equip, to mobilize, to send missionaries out, to support missionaries. So as a result also, there's a decline in the number of missionaries able to go out because of lack of church support. Okay, this is one area that I, uh, could be a reason for the low uptake. Yeah. So both the, the, the challenge, the equipping, and the supporting that's lacking in the church in the West. Thank you very much. Um, I'm interested in the interaction between two concepts that you raised. One, diaspora mission, and the other, reverse sending. So often in the work that I've been involved with over the years, when I hear the phrase diaspora mission, Asian diaspora mission, I'm thinking, okay, how do we reach out to the Asian diaspora present in our midst? But one of the examples you gave was the mission of the Asian diaspora, so the Filipino housemaids in Hong Kong or in Saudi Arabia or somewhere like that. That's a very different concept. Reverse sending then, when some of these large, Christian, large nations, newer Christian nations start to send, and I always had the vision of Chinese churches contacting Western churches and saying, okay, I want to send some workers. And the Western church response would be, oh good, there's lots of Chinese here to reach. And so we send people to reach their own. Whereas actually what we're crying out for is Asian workers to come and reach out to the native peoples of, of Europe. What's the connection, Lunli, between the diaspora mission and shifting from the focus only on diaspora to seeing their diaspora mobilized or the reverse mission mobilized to reach out to majority peoples? Thank you for the question. I deliberately gave example of diaspora workers going out because of this um, slightly changed picture or our perspective of diaspora work, as you say. We are thinking of, okay, they need the gospel. We reach to reach them. But then I think the, the situation has become more and more complex in the sense that it's not just reaching them, but they also reaching others. So reaching them to reach others, as well as they are coming to the so-called Christian country to reach us. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's, uh, it's uh, multi-directional now. It's not so, so, so straightforward. They come and they're being reached. Um, so they, they have, still have the needs. Some, many of them who are here still need the gospel. So we cannot say we don't need that anymore. So they still need to be reached, but there are others who can reach others and can also help the local church. So it's multi-directional, multi-facet, and so it's, not, it's quite messy in that sense. So we need to sit down and reflect and be more clear in our mind. Okay, we have this, we have this, and this. There's no conflict, but all of them may be happening at the same time. And how are we going to cope with this? So I think that, that is the key. I, I, you, you said it exactly. A lot of people still just remaining in the first stage, still thinking that is the only need but has grown the diaspora mission. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank I am you. Elia, and I'm from Indonesia, yeah. uh, doing my PhD here at the University of Manchester. Um, I totally agree with you about uh, your thought in regards to uh, how the Asian, Asian mission should be understood. It is, to, uh, it is for the church to be relevant, missional. And you mentioned some aspects uh, which uh, uh, explains uh, what do you mean by relevant, if I'm not mistaken to understand it. It is multi-faith, multicultural, poverty, persecution, increased uh, secularism in Asia. And I, I feel it. I think it's very relevant because I experienced that as an Indonesian. Uh, but there's one aspect that uh, I would like to ask you: What do you think? It is environmental crisis. What do you think? Is that also something uh, need to be considered by Asian mission, especially in the future? Because you mentioned cross culture. Uh, you mentioned indigenous theology and mission as one of. Uh, 
two important uh, issues to be considered for the uh, <coughs> mission in Asia in, uh, in the future. It is very important, I think, because indigenous uh, community always connected to environment. And yeah, in my experience in my hometown in West Timor, uh, I know exactly how a uh, uh, forest is distracted now by because of the influence of Christian mission in the past. So uh, would you consider that? Or if you know something uh, about that in Asia and other countries, would you please uh, share with okay. us with me? Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, thank you. Yes, that's a good good point to add in that context. Definitely, I fully, fully agree with you that that is very, very important, the environmental issue, which is a big concern. And um, we've known of um, uh, uh, projects, uh, indigenous projects, Indonesian. I have a friend who is a former student of Redcliffe as well. And uh, she's working with um, a group, a network, uh, helping forest conservation. Um, she's a, a dentist. And uh, these local people will come to her. And she, in exchange, I give you free dental care, but you stop cutting down trees, you know, that kind of uh, exchange, a deal, very right? common in Asia, you know, deal. So, and that seems to work very well, and she's been uh, very well known and, and, and able to uh, uh, do quite a bit for using her skill as a dentist in environmental issues. But it's growing and people are seeing this importance, but it's a lots of challenges, not easy because of the multi-corporations are still wanting to go in there and do their things, and governments sometimes give in to all these uh, multi-national uh, multi corporations. So, so, but it's, I agree with, I, I don't know what else I could say. I think you said, said it very well, yeah. If you like further interaction or some connections, I'm very happy to, to connect with you. I'm Soyeon Kim from South Korea, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Manchester. And I think during this corona, corona situation, um, many mission missionaries, they can't go to uh, their place because of the corona. So when I say that, it's, uh, we have to change some uh, some sending or or coming to some coming some missionaries that uh, situation should be changed in in the future after this corona, I guess. So, do you have any? Um, so, you already said about the future of mission. So, you're saying intercultural partnership and intergenerational intergener partnership. But I guess we have to see more. Um, for the things um, about this um, future of mission. So do you have any, um, any other <laughs> yeah, yeah, solution or suggestions for that? Yeah, sure. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, Thank you. yeah there, there are lots more that we could talk about, definitely. And more work needs to be done and more thinking and more work needs to be done. And I think this um, COVID-19 pandemic this crisis is really a game changer. And hopefully people don't revert to their old ways after they learn some new ways, but uh, we're not sure. So we need to put in some structure, maybe for example, when we talk about further things that we could do, say in an organization, we need to review our organizational structure so as to enable the local people to continue to have more control over what to do locally. Uh, maybe giving more room for more space for local leadership, for example. So um, this has to be factored in one of the things that we could. So organizationally, you can look at it, yeah, not just individually, right, right. And then also, I think now in in the global network, uh, there are lots of global network going on. That means it's not organization, it's not big organizations, but many small, big, medium-sized organizations coming together to form um, 
uh, to sit around the table, so to speak, okay, a round table, and to discuss what can we do to improve, to upgrade, so to speak, what we have been doing for the last 200 years. We cannot remain the same. We need to have uh, a, a shift in terms of our paradigm shift, our men's mindset shift and change. Um, so yeah, so these will be some of the challenges that we will be posed. We will pose to uh, people and organizations as they think of the future of mission. Yeah. Thank you. We'll invite Jacob, and then we have another question from the online participant. Thanks for being with us this Hi. evening. Thanks. When I lived in China at various points from 2007 to 2011. Uh, most Western missionaries I knew were experiencing more freedom than they ever had in evangelizing. And most Chinese Christians I knew felt like they could text their friends about their faith and even critique the, the government, you know, via texting and that kind of stuff. Uh, now, uh, you know, fast forward, almost all the missionaries I knew have been forced to leave, and those remaining are being forced to leave presently and praying about should they return. Uh, after the pandemic. And then most Chinese I know won't text me any, anymore about most things. Uh, so I'm pretty aware of the Western, the movement to kick most Western missionaries out of China, but not very well aware of how uh, the current president is affecting the Chinese church in China, both its, its growth and its health as well as its mission. I know this is a broad question, but I'm curious if you could just give a, a little bit of a snapshot of various um, uh, aspects to the Chinese church and its mission and the present reality under the current president. So, sure, thank yes, you. thank you. Well, whenever we talk about China, it's not a simple, straightforward uh, subject. As you know, it's a very complex country and with complex issues. So I think in terms of government, Chinese government, uh, their, um, their uh, relationship, you might may say, with the Christian church, a Christian mission is kind of a love-hate relationship in some sense. If they can see um, Christians bringing in good development, they will be very happy to let them have the freedom to grow and develop. Um, but of course, there are boundaries and how they, they will draw, you can't cross these boundaries. For example, their uh, Belt and Road initiatives is very, something very important to them. And if any activities that will um, uh, disrupt or interfere or hinder this project, they will come after you. They will, they will just come and, and try to trace um, where is your support come from, uh, where, who, who sent you here, what do you do? You know, they will just go straight. So it's both and you allow certain freedom, but do not cross certain lines. And I think that is the real, real situation in China. So I don't know whether I've answered your question. It's not so simple. But anyway, we want to know, or we want to just say one more thing is that the church in China, um, especially house churches, mainly the growth is still there in house churches. It still continues to grow. But the persecution of Christians also has grown up the notch in a higher level in terms of the world, war, world watch list I mentioned um, from 27 to now 17 in terms of the most persecuted countries, Christians being persecuted in the world, the 50 countries, okay, listed in the World Watch list. China is now number 17, it used to be 27. So that means persecution of Christians has gone up the scale. So is there freedom? Yes and no. We only, it's that kind of a situation in China, yeah. Is that fair enough? Do you think that that's okay? <laughs> Okay, so um, Han Lai Lao says this is a great topic and that she really appreciates all of the big picture data that you've provided. Um, but she wonders how we move from a believer's faith to actually fulfilling that intercultural vision. So what does the, the first steps of the doing look like? From the faith to intercultural? Yeah, for, so from an individual's oh, faith, faith to yeah. then starting to enact what you've described. Thank you, well... Well, I think um, this is a start, definitely, um, to help us to see the need to move forward and uh, to grow in the area. But how to do it, I think, first of all, just be interested in people of different cultures, just to be get out of your own shell, your own small circle of 
people or friends or church or whatever mission and get involved with people of different culture just to learn from them. And I think in doing that, you will grow in your understanding and your love and you see how God is working in their lives. And maybe that can help us as an individual, as, as a Christian, our faith, our discipleship um, and our perspective of uh, who God has um, brought into the kingdom. So uh, is that practical enough? I think just get out, eat different kind of food. For example, in Manchester, it's all over. I noticed we walk down the street, whoa, <laughs> all kinds of food here. So interesting for some, but irritating to others maybe. But anyway, for a Christian, I think that is a starting point. Yeah. Thank you, thanks so much. Okay. Well, please join me once again to express our thanks to Alon, our speaker today. Thank you. Thank you so much.